and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. That's right, if you're hearing Johann Sebastian Bach's Takata and Fugen D minor, that means we're doing a season that's all about scary movies for the Halloween time of year. For those of you who are new to the podcast, let me explain to you how we do things around here. Each season, we select a theme, and then we find six movies all related to that theme. Then on each episode, we take one of those movies and provide you details and background and fun facts behind how the movie was made. Then we spend way too much time discussing every scene of the film from start to finish to see if it's any good. And almost always, the movies that we discuss are not very good. Who is this us and we of which I speak? Well, it's none other than me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell. This is the inaugural episode of season 22, Deja Eel which features six remakes of iconic horror films that generated franchises of movies over the past decades. Tonight's episode takes a look at the remake of the Amityville Horror, a movie based on a movie based on a book that's based on a bunch of stuff people made up. Confused? Well, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to help separate fact from fiction when it comes to one of the most famous haunted house stories in the United States. Bo? Take it away! Ah, sweet autumn. The spooky season has arrived, and with it a new season of Pick 6 Movies, where we talk about all manner of gruesome and ghostly goings on. And if we are going to get ghostly, Let's start with arguably the most famous haunted house in the entire world, 112 Ocean Lane, a haunting best known as the Amityville Horror. Let's begin with the so-called facts of the haunting as laid down by the previous owners, George and Kathy Lutz. On November 13th, 1974, the residents of the home were all murdered save one. Ronald DeFeo Jr., known as Butch, had apparently murdered his entire family, his father Ronald, his mother Louise, and two brothers and two sisters. It was an undeniably brutal and bloody act as Butch killed his family while they lay sleeping in their beds. Butch was arrested and sentenced to prison because there were no other direct heirs besides the murderer sitting behind bars. The home at 112 Ocean Lane went up for sale. A year later, George and Kathy Lutz, not their real names of course, moved into the house. It was a steal on account of, you know, horrific murders and the house and all, but it was a deal that they couldn't pass up, so they moved into the house with their three children. According to the family, for 28 days they were terrorized by noxious sludge running from the faucets, doors were ripped off their hinges, cabinets opened and closed and red-eyed creatures peered through the windows, leaving cloven footprints in the snow. When the family called in a local priest to bless the house, he was physically struck by an unseen hand and told to get out by a demonic voice. He also suffered horrible blisters on his hands. Desperate to end their misery, the Lutzes contacted a local news crew who trailed psychics through the house who confirmed there was a demonic entity in the house. In this mix of touring psychics were Ed and Lorraine Warren. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to them. Left with no choice but to have their home cleansed by an exorcist, the Lutzes fled the home on Ocean Lane, never to return. Not long after that, they collaborated with novelist Jay Anson on a book entitled The Amityville Horror. Anson would swear to the book's veracity, stating, quote, There is simply too much independent cooperation of their narrative to support the speculation that the Lutzes either imagined or fabricated these events. End quote. And so began the controversy. Was this a real haunting or, what do you call it, uh, bullshit? That's the word. Well, plenty of researchers went to work to decide that very thing. One, Rick Moran interviewed the priest who had been called by the Lutzes. He said he never saw anything strange in the house. Well, what about those strange footprints in the snow? That one is made more complicated by the fact that, according to local weather reports at the time, 
there had been no snowfall in the area during the Lutz's stay in the house. As for the doors blown off hinges and cabinets ripped open, there was no evidence of any damage done to any of the original hardware in the house, including the hinges which would have had to have been replaced if doors were flying off the house. Another more circumstantial issue is that during this 28-day siege of terror, the Lutzes never once called the local police to report anything strange going on in or around the house. Eyewitnesses, neighbors, investigators, they all found huge problems with the narrative of the book and objective reality. We used to call those lies, but I guess in our modern world we would describe the Lutzes' story as a collection of alternative facts. And yet the Lutzes stuck to their guns. But why wouldn't they? They were making tens of thousands of dollars off of their story. Not too shabby for the late 70s. The most convincing debunking came from an unlikely source, William Weber, the attorney for Butch DeFeo. He said that he and the Lutzes sat down at their kitchen table one night and, quote, created this horror story over many bottles of wine. Weber was hoping that the story would grant his client an appeal given that his client was adamant about the voices he heard in the house. It's also worth noting this whole scheme was hatched in the wake of the success of both the book and film The Exorcist, which shot the idea of possession and demons into the public consciousness. The idea of a demon-infested house slowly possessing its owner isn't too great a stretch. As a final bit of circumstantial evidence, no owner of the house in Amityville has experienced any kind of supernatural goings-on besides those reported by Butch DeFeo, a murderer likely suffering from the auditory hallucinations brought on by schizophrenia and the stories of the Lutzes. There are still people who insist that the story is true. One of them is Daniel Lutz, one of the children who lived in the house. While he would have been very young at the time of the events, he says not only were he and George Lutz possessed by evil spirits, he's pretty sure it was George's interest in the occult that opened the spiritual door to affect the entire family. How do we know what Daniel Lutz thinks? Why, there's a whole documentary about it called My Amityville Horror. In it, Daniel speaks with Lorraine Warren, who confirms time and again that what Daniel remembers was just how it happened. So let's talk about Ed and Lorraine Warren. If you have seen the very popular Conjuring series of films, you know who I'm talking about. In the movies, they are two-fisted demon hunters, saving souls and rescuing children from the clutches of ghostly and demonic forces. In reality, they were nothing more than a couple of crooks. Ed and Lorraine Warren met young. Lorraine was only 16 when she attended a screening of a James Cagney movie at a theater where Ed was an usher. They married when she was 18, and Ed supported them by selling his paintings on the side of the road while he attended art school. When that didn't pay the bills, they cooked up a scam in which they would look up newspaper reports of haunted houses and such, and then Ed would stand outside the house and paint it with ghosts coming out of it. Then they would present this spooky painting to the owners of the house and weasel their way inside. And while they didn't go so far as to charge these poor saps for paintings of their, and I can't use finger quotes enough here, paranormal research, the Warrens also used their entries into the homes and lives of people who claimed their houses were haunted as grist for a number of articles that they would publish about these so-called investigations. Ed claimed to be a demonologist, which isn't a thing, and Lorraine claimed to be a medium, also not a real thing. With a combined talent for fraud, the couple bounced around the country exploring paranormal occurrences and making some cash by doing college lectures and holding seminars about their efforts in the world of the occult, not to mention writing a bunch of books about this. In 1975, the Warrens inserted themselves into the Amityville case, which as you may recall was a bunch of make-em-ups created by Butch DeFeo's attorney and the Lutz family, and the Warrens were mentioned by name in the book Jay Anson wrote. They used this as a means to sell more books of their own, not to mention the haunted museum they opened up in their home, and they were, naturally, happy to go on local news programs to talk all about how haunted the house was. Sadly, you can hear Lorraine talk way more about the Amityville house in the documentary I mentioned before, My Amityville Horror, 
in which Daniel Lutz discusses how his life was ruined by these occurrences in the house, but what a viewer might really come away from is thinking that Lorraine Warren is an enabling vulture who is feeding into the very real mental issues of a middle-aged man wrestling with a crazy story his parents foisted on their children and came to define his life in very damaging ways. But maybe you're an optimist and you're saying to yourself, Bo, the Warrens can't be that bad, right? They were trying to help people. Well, let's take a look at the help they offered. The Conjuring series of films is based on the, again, finger strain to air quote this, case files of the Warrens. The original was debunked by the current owner of the home, so in this case, the Warrens and one of the daughters of the family who owned the home during the supposed haunting are just telling a story. Fine. Then there was the second Conjuring movie, featuring the story of the Enfield haunting, which is arguably the most famous haunted house story from England. The Warrens were never part of that investigation at all and only showed up uninvited to the house once they saw reports of it. Other horror movies based on cases the Warrens were involved with include The Conjuring The Devil Made Me Do It, which was another case of a murder in which the killer claimed possession as a defense, but that turned out to be a bunch of bullshit too, and The Haunting in Connecticut, featuring a family who bought a former funeral home. In that case, the family was characterized by mental illness and alcohol abuse, and later investigators had difficulty getting corroborating stories from the family members, leading everyone to believe this too was a load of hooey. Ed Warren also reportedly described the family involved to another writer covering the haunting, saying, They're crazy. All the people who come to us are crazy. That's why they come to us. Just use what you can and make the rest up. You write scary books, right? Well, make it up and make it scary. The New England Skeptical Society dogged the Warrens, searching for a shred of veracity in any of their claims. Stephen Novella, a member of said society and a professor at the Yale School of Medicine and a trained neurologist to boot, you know, a professional person and critical thinker, he described their occult museum as, quote, full of off-the-shelf Halloween junk, dolls, and toys. The Warrens, of course, forbade him from accompanying them on any investigations, and Ed Warren finally told them, quote, you can't have scientific evidence for a spiritual phenomenon. When they claimed they had video evidence of a white lady haunting the Union Cemetery in Connecticut, Novello asked to see the video. He was allowed to, but only in the Warren's home, and no copies would be given up for further inspection. Novello described it thusly. The tape shows an apparent white human figure moving behind some tombstones. Like videos of UFOs, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster, however, the figure is at that perfect distance and resolution so that a provocative shape can be seen, but no details which would aid definitive identification. Ed Warren has not investigated the video with any scientific rigor and refuses to allow others to do so. The most horrific thing the Warrens were involved in is the inclusion of a young woman into their home and claims that Ed groomed her from the age of 15, conducting a 40-year relationship with her. Oh, and when Lorraine Warren signed away rights for those Conjuring movies, not only did the agreement include verbiage that the Warrens couldn't be criticized, but there was specific wording that restricted talk of, quote, sex with minors, child pornography, prostitution, or sexual assault. Nope, nothing suspicious there. Ultimately, the Warrens are dead, and the world is likely a better place for it. And if they have anything to say for themselves in regards to the years of hucksterism, fraud, and exploitation, they are welcome to haunt me. I'll keep you all posted if I hear anything from their criminal corpses. But what have the movies made about the Amityville murders? We've established that the story the Lutzes told and the ensuing book were fiction, but it did make for a good story. The rights to the book were bought up by MGM after the book proved to be a bestseller. Originally conceived as a made-for-TV movie, it found its way to the big screen after landing heavy-hitting leads like James Brolin, seen just last season on Pick 6 Movies in Westworld, and Margot Kidder, who was hot off her role as Lois Lane in Superman the Movie. Brolin said he agreed to do the film after reading the novel and getting a scare when his pants slipped off a chair, making him jump while he was reading the creepy book, and he thought, hey, this might make for a good scary movie. 
But neither the 1979 film or the remake were filmed in the actual house on 112 Ocean Lane. The 79 film used a stand-in in Toms River, New Jersey, while the 2005 remake used a home in Salem, Wisconsin. And there's a reason the original is still talked about. I've always enjoyed its low-rent charms and its relative restraint as a haunted house movie, and I wasn't the only one. The movie was an enormous hit, going on to become the second biggest film of the year, fueled by the notion that this was a true story. James Brolin and Margot Kidder were encouraged by the studio, AIP, to suggest that there were spectral shenanigans during the filming, but Kidder confirmed later that all the stories of funny feelings on the set were kind of crap meant to gin up some business for the movie. And the Amityville Horror spawned numerous sequels, and finally, in 2005, a remake. As soon as word got out that a new version of the story was in the works, George Lutz came around looking for a little cash after not having been consulted on this new take on the material. He said MGM had never gotten rights to do the remake from him, and MGM countersued and said, well, we didn't need rights from you in the first place, George Lutz, and the whole thing was ultimately resolved when George Lutz died in 2006. Ryan Reynolds took over the role made famous by James Brolin, and at the time, his biggest film was National Lampoon's band Wilder, unless you count Blade Trinity, which you absolutely should not. Melissa George stepped into the shoes of Kathy Lutz, an actress who has been working steadily for about 25 years, but not so you notice. She worked in her native Australia for several years before making her way to U.S. television, and aside from a bit part in David Lynch's Mulholland Drive, this was her big break for American movie audiences. She's never been a huge star, but she's a working actor, and ain't nothing wrong with that. I also liked her quite a bit in a mind-bending movie called Triangle. You might want to give a spin sometime. Aside from bulldog-made human Philip Baker Hall, who takes over the part of the priest, which Rod Steiger played in the original, the real breakout is Chloe Grace Moretz, who would go on to be a superstar of a child actor, best known as Hit Girl in the kick-ass films, or as the vampire in Let Me In, a surprisingly good remake of the excellent Let the Right One In. The movie was released in April of 2005, and it hit big. It made over $100 million globally, fueled by name recognition and riding the wave of modern horror remakes, some of which we'll discuss this very season, and almost all of which are quite bad. But, is this remake worth the price of admission? Or should we have steered clear of 112 Ocean Lane? The only way to know that is to get in with your friend and mine, Chad Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, Georges and Cathy's, it's 2005's The Amityville Horror. Welcome back to Pick 6 Movies. I am one of your hosts, Bo. And I'm your other host, Chad. <laughs> oh, well, we had a whole shtick there. I didn't even realize we were doing that. That's our thing. I guess it is now. And we are sitting at the, the precipice of season 22. 22, Deja Ooh. Yes. That's what the t-shirts say. You can buy it at our merch shop. Do we have a merch shop? Uh-huh. It's pick6movies.com forward slash Deja Ooh forward slash merch dash shirt. <laughs> slash OnlyFans slash man feet dot php <laughs> and you can get it there uh you want to buy one for the whole family christmas is right around the corner but what's really right around the corner as, as you're listening to this is halloween yes your favorite holiday bo it, absolutely my favorite holiday as we're recording this i'm constructing halloween decorations they are getting more elaborate year over year i'm having to buy little motors to make things work and uh uh, yeah, it's a it's a real to do. But more than that, every year I assemble a list of 31 horror movies that I watch for the month of October. You know, there's 31 days in October. I didn't at the time I made the list. <laughs> But when I realized that later, because you're not the first person to, to point that out to me, it felt very serendipitous. There's also 31 flavors at Baskin Robbins. That's what I based it on. 
Those, <laughs> one scary movie for every pint I'm going to eat. <laughs> Superman ice cream. Yes, please. Birthday cake. Don't mind if I do. Coffee. Okay. You know, I don't mind a coffee ice cream. What I don't like, I, I like fruit and I like ice cream, but I don't like fruit in ice cream. I like marshmallows and I like ice cream, but I don't like marshmallows frozen in ice cream. I don't disagree with that. I think Rocky Road is three fifths of a really good ice cream and it gets a little big for its bridges. <laughs> It's a little ambitious for my taste. It is the ice cream that's doing cocaine in the bathroom and then coming back out to be like, hey, you like fudge chunks? What about nuts? What about chocolate ice cream? I got a little marshmallow too. And you're like, whoa, 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 Rocky Road. Take it down a notch, right. man. Yeah. You're way too thirsty. You're trying really hard. You are what the kids call extra right now. <laughs> Tone it down. I'm just going to go over to my friend Chocolate Chip, who <laughs> understands the value of restraint. <laughs> what are we talking about? Oh, but so I assemble a list of 31 movies every year. And going through and watching some of the movies that we're going to talk about this season is mm -hmm. a great deal of fun. Not so much the movies that we're actually talking about as subjects of the episode but the movies that they're based on yeah for example chad i don't know if you understand how this premise works but let me explain it to you so <laughs> i was in the meeting i was there i showed up late but i was there so deja vu beads for tonight for example we're talking about the amityville horror but Ooh, not really not the good one <laughs> What? okay we're not talking about the 1979 one <laughs> not the old one yeah with james brolin <laughs> and that amazing beard and that hair oh my god i mean <laughs> you're in real jeff bridges territory <laughs> With that 79 James Brolin look. You run your fingers through this hair and they just get lost forever. I mean, the real horror was that he ever shaved it. <laughs> and Marco Kidder, who is really just a pack of Virginia slimps come to life. Sure. <laughs> is also uh, really good at that movie. Superman, do you like pink? <laughs> Oh, look, I'm standing behind the lead planta. You can't see my coochie coo. Can you read my mind? Like, yeah, you don't even have to. I see a bodega. How about you cruise by? My lighter doesn't work up here. Use your heat vision. Why don't you take care of both of these for me? That's really what I want to see is Lois Lane sitting at home with her feet kicked up, holding a cigarette. Hey, give it the little dink a dink a do, would you? This gin and tonic's gotten a little warm. Why don't you freeze it up and give it a little blow? Oh, there we my. go. That's my boy. You like pink? I used to, Lois. <laughs> Shut up! I think I've got to go fight evil, Lois. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, the man of steel has to make his grand exit. Pick me up a cotton of Paul Malls while you're out. Unfiltered. Extra tall. You know what I like. Yes, I do, Lois. You better not be out all night with that Mr. Freeze. <laughs> Just because his wife <laughs> is stuck in some kind of tube doesn't mean you need to be going out gallivanting around with Super Village trying to pick up some strange. You can tell how much we want to talk about a movie by how much padding we put on the front end of one of these reviews i don't know what you mean yeah so in 2005 or you know 2004 i suppose someone got the bright idea to remake the amityville horror sure they were remaking everything else which is pretty much all we're talking about this season the early aughts was like this microwave oven of classic 70s and 80s horror movies yeah why well, don't we want to spoil what's coming down the pipe but you pretty much know where we're going right think of a good horror movie that got remade <laughs> and that remake came out in the early early to mid 2000s and that's us for the next three months <laughs> yeah yeah and so this one starts off with the platinum dunes logo which is something that you're gonna see more of this season oh yeah the brad fuller michael bay nonsense company that has been the bane of my cinematic life for as long as it's existed because it oh man what a garbage production company this is so right off the bat chat uh-huh we get an insert yes that says based on the the true story yeah that that generates only slightly more legitimacy than a nice inspired by a true story suggested by a thing i heard a guy say once based on something i overheard while he's dropping on a conversation at the bus station but you know i wanted to ask you though when you were a kid mm -hmm. do you remember the amityville horror being a thing oh yeah 
we were very young. Right now, we're somewhat old. But when I was a kid, like, this movie was a horrific thing of suburban, urban legend. It was in the late 70s. And as you mentioned in the intro, the devil and kind of the occult were everywhere. You know, you kind of noted the exorcist and like the omen and Rosemary's Baby. And I don't know how those movies fall in relationship to the Amityville Horror. But this movie scared the shit out of me just from watching television commercials for it. Mm -hmm. Like all of the flies in the attic and there were murders and it was a real life haunted house. I mean, it was terrifying. And I think you and I both read the book, what, in like Mm -hmm. middle school, probably? If that, it might have even been earlier. Yeah, for you, but you were a better reader than me. I looked at it. I was like, hey, there are pictures of flies in this book. I might be able to read this. <laughs> and like, <laughs> this, this book is a solid 13% fly drawing. So I think I'm already feeling good about my chances of making it through to the final page. As a kid, you know, you're stupid and you're like, this is real. And then you're just like, oh my God, it's terrifying. And then as you said, it's all bullshit. And you learn that later and you're like, what the fuck was that? Just an endless barrage of lies. It had a profound impact on me as a very young child that house those quarter moon windows look Mm -hmm. like eyes peering down on you it is truly iconic as you said it is the american haunted house and the score for that movie was nominated for an oscar i could see that it's a pretty damn good score yeah yeah it's very eerie and when i read the book and then i don't know if i read the book first or saw the movie maybe i saw the movie first the get out really stuck with me the flies all over rod steiger Mm -hmm. the red room and having to save harry the dog at the end of that movie Mm -hmm. like all of that stuff really stuck with me the thing i like about the movie uh the original amityville horror is that most of the stuff especially in the early goings feels very slight there are a lot of problems with that movie in retrospect but it does do a really good job of escalating and so by the time you get to the 28th day and blood is coming out of the walls and the wind is going crazy and George is almost murdering everybody. Like, it feels earned. You feel like you went on a journey to get to this place where the wheels are totally coming off of the demonic wagon i think the only thing from the original that doesn't align with your analysis is that george lutz like on day two is immediately going through heroin detox (laughs) yeah in this version of the movie his progression into madness is more aligned with the shining which we will touch on here in a minute Mm -hmm. and it is a slower de-evolution is that the word devolution yeah yeah. i just trademarked that so don't steal it if you do i'm gonna get you yeah and don't let the band Devo know that we talked about this. <laughs> but it is a much slower progression. In the original movie, it's true, like, day one, I love this house. Day two, I'm gonna kill you fuckers. Like, you're like, whoa! <laughs> it's cold in here. <laughs> it's a flip of a switch. Why is it so cold, and why are your kids so terrible? <laughs> why do I want to murder them so much? So let's jump into this one. So we get the based on the true story, blah, blah, blah. And then they give us, Bo, a date stamp. Uh-huh. November 13th, 1974. And Bo, you were just what a year Uh old yeah i was like a year and a half you know we were so adorable when this guy slaughtered his family while they slept i don't want to paint ronnie defeo jr as a hero or anything or that sympathetic (laughs) a figure because he murdered his whole family but i do have some sympathy (laughs) for the fact that he was probably living with this undiagnosed mental illness sure and then murdered his whole family and then became the center of this story in a lot of ways when really he just (laughs) needed some psychiatric help but we get a bunch of quick edits because again it's the early 2000s yeah with a guy ronnie Ronnie. yeah being told by his tv to kill them and he's like all right tv whatever you say Mm -hmm. and he's loading his rifle we see that it's 3 15 a.m on the clock and he's down in the basement of this house and he's staring at that old timey RCA Indian head test logo symbol. Mm-hmm. And then, like you said, and it's seeing a TV tell you to kill people. It does have whiffs of poltergeist to it because mm-hmm. that's not part of the original movie. No, or no, book, no, no. I don't think like this is all bullshit. <laughs> Like, like well, bullshit on top of bullshit. Right, right, right. It's the, the bullshit cherry on top of the bullshit Sunday. That's not in the movie. That's just something that I deal with here at home. 
And <laughs> then we get a glimpse of the boathouse outside the house, which is going to kind of figure into the movie, but not in any real concrete way. There's a bunch of lightning strikes, and we see this ashtray full of cigarette butts. And there's a copy of a book titled Evil is Proof of God mm -hmm. by Timothy W. Teed, which is not a real book. That's bullshit. Much like this whole movie, it's all inspired by things that are kind of sort of real. And this book looks a whole lot like a book titled Evil and the Evidence of God by Douglas Givette, which focuses on how you can reconcile the existence of evil with the idea of a benevolent God. And, but that book was published in 1995, 10 years before this movie came out, but 20 years after the events of the movie that we're watching. It's just a bullshit sandwich with bullshit sauce on top of it and a nice tall glass of bullshit for you to drink. But that particular bullshit means you don't have to pay rights to the author of the real book. Not at all. <laughs> I like when Ronnie pulls out his shotgun and all of this is shot in black and white with just a splash of light sepia tones mm -hmm. as to not turn off the teenagers who snuck in to see this movie because they hate black and white movies. So stupid. Try to show the kids the movie Harvey the <laughs> other day and they were just like, nope. Where's the rabbit? You said there's a rabbit. Well, it's invisible. What? How come this guy isn't in color? Well, none of the movie is in color because of the film they were using. That stupid i'll be upstairs playing Fortnite if you need anything grandpa i watched the abbott and costello movie where the two of them went to africa it was problematic yes africa screams i think is the name of that one <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> and it had been colorized and i was so disappointed because it, it all looks washed out with yeah. this weird splish splash of who gives a shit about this that's what'll keep the young people interested let's make it color you dumb asses right that's what's keeping people away from it's a wonderful <laughs> life at this point it's like <laughs> Well, I just don't know what color his hair is. How on earth can I concentrate on this touching story of a man losing everything and then gaining the world? Ruddy DeFeo is running around the house shooting people. Mom and dad shoots them in their back. How does that not wake up everybody else in the house? Like, if I'm in my house and I hear, like, blam, blam, like, whoa, what was that? If you'll recall, Chad, from our early days, in the book, that was actually a point that proved, he says in quotes, that there was a demonic force happening because it was assisting him by keeping all the people asleep because they were all shot in the back. In reality, I didn't look into the forensics of this, but mm -hmm. it could also just be that this is a big house. There's a storm going on. Had a heavy meal. Went right. to the sizzler. <laughs> Everybody's all uh, sedated by mac and cheese and mashed potatoes. But one of the girls, Chad, is awake. Jody. So she's like cowering in the attic and then runs into her closet. With her teddy bear bow. That's adorable. Slash horrifying. <laughs> and also a little bit misbegotten. Because she's like, what's wrong, Ronnie? Why do you have that gun? And why are you looking at me with demonic eyes? And he says, I love you, Jody. And then shoots yeah we don't see her get it but he blammo shoots. blammo yeah they hide all of the gruesome murders by turning the lights off of the movie and then turning them back on real quick yeah i mean it's a real like discotheque of murder and mayhem and then we get a shot outside the house where we see that the sign on the lawn says high hopes mm -hmm. and you're like oh that's he's ironic got high hope he's got high hope bam bam oh yeah he's got high apple pie I gonna die, I hopes. And then we get the title of the movie, right. the Amityville Horror. I love these credits. And in voiceover, we hear a woman say, Suffolk County Police, how may I help you? He shot him. He shot them all. This guy on the phone, he's like, everybody's dead. Uh, they all got shot. Like, maybe I should explain a little backstory before I jump into the good stuff. My name's Saul. I own the bar here in Amity. The Wicked Pissa. You probably know it. Anyway, you guys come down here all the time. This fella shows up with a shotgun in his hand. He's covered in blood. And I take his gun and I put it in the corner with all the other guns what come in here. And I says to him, I says, hey, look like you had a rough day. You know what? happened and i give the guy a couple of shapers and we talk a little bit it turns out that this guy he tells me he shot his parents and his kid brothers and his kid sisters and maybe a stuffed teddy bear and then the worst part of it all listen to this shit he ain't got no money to pay for the shapers what i gave him as well as them three pickled eggs that he fished out of that jaw at the end of the bar nobody's opened it for like four years look can you send a patrol car down here to uh, maybe uh, see if anthony or tony jay's working tonight maybe they could rough him up a little bit tell him it's all from the pissa they, they owe me a favor 
but yeah, thanks a lot. All right. And then there are other flashes because I get the editing is so quick and all over the place in this movie with newspaper clippings about the murders and the trial and yeah. shots of the funerals. Imagine a commercial for any Dateline NBC special. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> and so when we finally get done with these terrible credits, which I'm normally not the anti-credits guy on this show. That's me. But these are bad. <laughs> you can buy a shirt at our merch shop. I'm the anti-credits guy at uh, pick6movies.com slash merch slash discord slash ebay. I'm the anti-credits guy dot uh, ASP. Question mark. I think there's a question mark in there. <laughs> right. That's that's where you put the, the campaign tracking code at the end so we know who's driving all this traffic to our merch site. Making all that merch money. That's how we keep this show alive with all that merch money. Yeah, and not paying the interns. It's the, the one-two punch <laughs> is merch money and not paying anybody. And then our movie just fades to black. Mm -hmm. And then we fade back in and we're in suburbia, 1974, Deer Park, Long Island, mm -hmm. one year later, Bo. Now, Bo, mm -hmm. Long Island, I looked this up on the internet, is approximately 28 miles <laughs> from Amity, New York. Uh -huh. It's one year into the future. Uh -huh. So what I'm saying is that everybody and their brother and their sisters know 100% about this family that was murdered. Apparently... <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't reached 28 miles yet. You have to remember there was no internet at the time, Chad. No, but there was like two TV stations and one newspaper. This was the biggest story in the world when this happened, right? Radio waves travel slower than internet. <laughs> when the cold, when the temperature is colder. <laughs> in, Long, in upstate New York, the radio <laughs> waves take upwards of five to seven years to travel it's the 20 litmus miles. Configure, it's the litmus configuration. Yeah, it's the litmus configuration, yeah. So Melissa George, playing Kathy Lutz in this movie, wakes Ryan Reynolds up with a good old-fashioned boo. And he's like, hey, hey, what are you doing? How about uh, we just make out a little? We're both incredibly attractive people. He's got this nicely trimmed lumberjack beard. They start smooching. And then they look up and they're surprised. And Ryan Reynolds says, uh, hey, Michael. And cut to this weird kid wearing a swimming mask and pajamas. Mm -hmm. And I was just thrilled that he wasn't wearing a clown mask with a butcher knife in his hand, seeing as his name was Michael and he's watching two adults have sex. Where's your sister, Michael? Michael, <laughs> though, <laughs> is like. <laughs> what are you doing with my mom? Hey, you! Get your damn hands off of her! Hey there, buddy. Why don't you hop up in bed with us? I mean, you're not interrupting anything. Get on this side of the bed, all right? You don't want to be on your mom's side of the bed. It's basically a, a swamp of sweat and drool and ryan reynolds own secret sauce also don't sit on my lap or i'm going to jail melissa george gets up and she says i'm gonna go in the bathroom and sort of uh clean up a little bit and this kid michael he comes up into the bed and avoids ryan reynolds boner that's still in his pants and uh, on the night side table there's a photo of three kids consisting of michael his older brother billy who we'll meet in a moment and their younger sister chelsea and also in the photo is their dad who you're like is he dead are they divorced is this a classic i'm heading out for a pack of smoke situation we don't know yet but michael looks at a picture of this father and says george did you ever beat my dad and ryan reynolds says no buddy i just cut his brakes michael says to him do i have to call you dad and ryan reynolds says hey pal you can call me whatever you want and michael says anything what if i call you stinky or poopy head and ryan reynolds like sure pal you can call me whatever you want and then melissa george she's in the bathroom and she's smiling and just giggling because they're bonding together. And Michael says, what if I call you crap monkey fart? And he's like, hey, pal, we got to draw the line somewhere. Come on, buddy. And then Michael says, hey, what if I call you Adolf Hitler? Like when we're in public and we're walking past the synagogue? Look, uh, I don't think that's a great idea, pal. But what if I call you, hey, there's that guy who puts peanut butter on his dick and lets neighborhood dogs lick it off. What if I call you that? I'd really rather not. I think that could affect my business. What if I call you, hey, there's Who's that guy who tries to touch me in the bathroom? You know what? I think it's time that you go to school. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to call you Susan, my stepdad. It's confusing and embarrassing for you, but it won't get the cops called anytime soon. See you later, Susan. <sighs> 
I guess it's the best of a bad bunch. And so they go down to breakfast where we meet the older kid, Billy. Ryan Reynolds is cooking up a batch of runny scrambled eggs. Mm -hmm. And he slops some onto Billy's plate. And also Chelsea, the youngest sister, is there. And Billy looks at this food and he's like, these eggs suck. He's like, you know what? I'm walking to school. I'm 12 years old. I'm basically a man. I got armpit hairs. One on this side and two on this side. I don't need to have my reputation crapped on by the likes of stepdad Susan over here. Hey, I kissed a girl this summer and I think I got her pregnant doing that. So I'm pretty much a man now. <laughs> Melissa George comes in and she says, look, we're dropping you off because your stepfather, Ryan Reynolds and I, we have a big day today. We're going to look at houses. And so sure enough, Ryan Reynolds and Melissa George go to this house in Amityville. They're in his truck before they get there talking about like these houses, honey, they're just out of our price range. There's no way we're going to be able to afford any of these. Well, look, it says here in the paper that the price is only $41,000 and your firstborn. Come on. We don't even have any children. We can afford this. I think they mean Chelsea, but side note, I'm totally okay with it. <laughs> they pull up to the house, which is this home of murders that we saw at the start of the film. And the realtor comes out and she says, this is an amazing house you're gonna love it and let me just start off by saying as a homeowner myself when they walk up to this house by my estimated count and i paused it to give an estimated count there are 150 tiny window panes a wrapping around this glass porch keeping this anywhere close to clean is a full-time job this is a deal breaker as we'll come to find out it's billy that's going to be buried the brunt of that work <laughs> when they walk into the house melissa george reaches over and kind of appears to grab Grab Ryan Reynolds' ass mm -hmm. as they go inside, which I was like, hey, who can blame her? I'm a career heterosexual, but if given the chance, I'd grab Ryan Reynolds' ass. And that's a two way street. I mean, Melissa George is gorgeous in this. Like, this is a handsome couple. The scene when they have sex together, I was like, absolutely. You know? A hundred percent. I wish this was the whole movie. We may have discussed this on this podcast. Are there famous people that you're like, I'd like to see them have sex? Like, that would be worth the price of admission. Almost all of them. <laughs> like, what I wouldn't give to see, like, Harrison Ford and Shia LaBeouf Wait, going after Harrison it? Ford and Shia LaBeouf yeah. having sex? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm thinking about, like, Sofia Vergara and, like, Joe, what's his name? Pantaleano? Yeah, that guy. <laughs> Joey Pants. Like, what? <laughs> Not Joey Pants. You know, that's a good couple. Oh. That story of legend where Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were having sex at some resort so violently, like, that they called the cops? Mm -hmm. Good for them. I am up for seeing anybody having sex with anybody in any movie. That is my rule. I don't care I don't who know it about is. that. Like in About Schmidt, where Kathy Bates and Jack Nicholson had sex. Oh, sure. Or they were going to. Yeah. I don't want to see that. I want to see it all. Really? Oh, yeah. You, you know what? You have a very exotic palate when it comes to watching things like that. I do. I'm more of a like a chicken tenders cheese pizza kind of fella. Give me good looking folks doing the devil's deed. That's what I want to see. Do I prefer good looking people? Of course. But also... <laughs> <laughs> Every now and again, do you want escargot? Sure, it's a little slimy, but it's delicious. Sure. And I like somebody that feels like they don't deserve to have sex, and therefore they're really putting in the effort. That's why I think, <laughs> speaking of actors in this movie, Philip Baker Hall probably fucks like a beast. Yeah, I would agree with that. So he said, changing the subject, our hero and our heroine, they walk inside the house, and they enter like the main entrance, and this whole home is full of this carved woodwork again dusting and keeping this free of filth and all of the nooks and crannies is a second full-time job they go in and ryan reynolds says this is a mistake here in the paper says that this house costs 40 percent below market value this could be the deal of a lifetime and the realtor says what's wrong with that this house was built in 1892 by a man named evo shandor maybe you heard <laughs> of him from ghostbusters he was into some interesting hobbies well enough about that let's talk about this part of the crime scene i mean the children's bedroom it's good 
for children to sleep in or get shot in. And the floors are hardwood, easy to clean up. Messes the kids make, like when they spill the juice or the fingerprints or the brains and the innards. You know, boys will be boys. Am I right? Dude, as she is showing them around the house, she straight up sees a shadow person moving around on the wall. And it's just like, yeah. nope, nope. Got to keep that one to myself, Edith. Keep it to yourself. It just, it just get out of here. You told me to sell this house. You need more people to kill more people. You get out of here. Let me do my job. Do you want souls or not? Ryan Reynolds looks out the window of the second or third story. And he's like, hey, is that a boathouse? That's fantastic. I own a boat. And my boat's looking for a home to buy too. Huh, you know what? Boat's going to be so excited to hear about this. I call him Booty. She shows him the basement, ultimately. It's very spacious down there. It could be a playroom or a game room, sacrifice room. The possibilities are endless, especially focusing on that last object. Why don't you all go downstairs? I'm going to wait up here because I want to live to see another day. Maybe it's just a room where you can, you know, hang out and be creepy and listen to the voices telling you to kill your family. It could be a man cave or a jack shack. Jack shack and man cave are pretty much the same thing. You ever been to somebody's house and they're like, this is my man cave? Like, just no. <laughs> bunch of fucking sports memorabilia and shit all over the place and a tv and a kegerator just like what the fuck are you doing i would like it if it were all like paper mache rocks and a <laughs> fire in the middle of the room this is my man cave uh you'll notice here that i've got it set up so it's almost a perfect illustration of the allegory of the cave from plato you'll see over there there's no direct light but i do see shadows striking the wall here it's uh maybe a little esoteric but i find it comfortable it's just my thinking spot <laughs> over here i took old quarter pipe i used to use them on my skateboarding days and what i've done is i've spray painted it and i've turned it into essentially the hill that sisyphus used to push the rock up and every day i just come in here and fucking do the same goddamn thing eight <laughs> day after day after day and it's a reminder of my lost youth and how much i fucking hate living but uh i can't kill myself because my life insurance won't pay off if i do that but anyway if you want go over there and there's some shafers and schlitz there's some blats i think in the back there might be a heineken or a microbrew that one of my wife's queer friends brought over to drink, but I don't drink that kind of shit because I'm a real man. Y'all want to watch some porno? Take off your pants, man. It's a jack shack. It's a man cave. That's what you do. Sisyphus rock, whatever you want. We're just men being men. You want to hold hands? All right, I get it. We'll bridge too far. Bridge too far. Jackpot, you got that Sam Adams pumpkin spice. <laughs> That's been hiding in there for a while. That's from like 1917, 16. It's still good, man. It's been pasteurized, I'm sure. If that was when they were still just shoving the corks <laughs> in the top. You may want to aim that away from somebody. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, aim it at me. Because if that cork goes through my skull, <laughs> cha-ching. We get that life insurance payout. Man cave. What the fuck is wrong with people? <laughs> so Ryan Reynolds is like, listen to me, Melissa George. If we buy this house, we're not going to have two thin dimes to rub together. Aside from the money, we're going to be sinking into this goddamn place. I want to buy it. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> and so you hear a scream as you focus on Edith. And Edith is like, oh, it got him already. And then <laughs> they come upstairs and they're like, no, it turns out we're going to buy this house. We don't know how we're going to get the money, even though it's theoretically within our price range. So we were just biting off more than we could chew right from the jump. Look, realtor, whose name isn't important enough to speak out loud in the movie. What's the catch? Why is this house so cheap? And the realtor says, well, there is a little incident. I should tell you about a teeny tiny little kerfuffle. The family that used to live here last year, I'm sure you didn't hear anything about it, seeing as you live. 28 long miles away <laughs> that's right we live in deer park we don't get any news there <laughs> family that lived here well the oldest son he was arrested and now the family just doesn't live here anymore that's what happened what do you think about that melissa george i mean as far as i'm all concerned, right there's a couple more details i gotta tell oh. you legally he was arrested for murder and look a murder that happened in this neighborhood near this house well it was inside this house okay a murder happened in the house well it was murders murders you know there were multiple murders it was five murders to be exact but you know what they all happened on the same night. You know what? Let's just say there was one act of murder. One act of murder. That sounds better, doesn't it? It was just one simple act of murder. That's all that happened in this house five times. When Melissa George looks at Ryan Reynolds, he says, well, you know, houses don't kill people. People kill people. Dude, two minutes ago, he wasn't even on board for paying for this house. And now he's like, you know what? This is a real fixer-upper. I mean, he tells her <laughs> that if she really 
likes the house that they'll make it work and she's like oh george she all but jumps up and does the leg wrap around the crotch then chad we come to day one do we get an insert between day one and day 28 yes there is one other insert at day 15 so we check it at the halfway point <laughs> okay <laughs> not often and in fact one of my notes was oh yeah we're doing days forgot about that for a minute you know the only time i ever really had a countdown for dates in a movie was when we saw the doors in the mm -hmm. theater and i remember the air conditioning broke in the theater and it was hot as can be and i was just like praying for like the year like 1972 or 73 when jim morrison died mm -hmm. when it showed up i was like great we're at the end of this slog self-indulgent who gives a shit movie that's a movie that doesn't <laughs> hold up real well no not at all so our family pulls up to the house and michael the middle child he leaps from the car and he runs towards this haunted house and he's screaming we're rich we're rich thanks susan you're the best susan i've ever had and then we get this montage of the whole family moving into the house using this grainy 18 millimeter homemade movie footage and there's this instrumental knockoff of the laws there she goes playing in the background it's like the opening of the wonder years everybody's smiling the grown-ups are carrying the kids around they're all having a great time melissa george does her best cameron diaz impression as she shakes her ass at the camera and then but we see a dog first off uh-oh second off <laughs> when did they get a dog yeah that's new to the movie let me just say because we're gonna do a little compare and contrast this season uh -huh. in the original movie there is a dog and the dog does what dogs do in haunted house movies barks at corners is intuitive about spooky shit that's going on and at the end of that movie Movie, our male protagonist george in this case it's ryan reynolds he goes back to save the dog yeah spoilers that's not what happens in this movie <laughs> oh no not even <laughs> close <laughs> it's a real the lost world colon jurassic park type of a movie like if we see a dog that dog's getting killed absolutely but also <laughs> this whole montage theoretically takes place in a day but by the end of this day they are completely moved in we've got yeah. the dog we've got the kids everything's put away we've yep. repainted some stuff sure they put a new roof on the house they've all got new jobs the kids have graduated college somehow billy's married ryan reynolds has alzheimer's <laughs> It's a real tragic tale that happens in these 24 hours. Who is this Susan they keep talking about? <laughs> but that night, Melissa George puts all the kids to bed. Prayers suck. I'm not saying my prayers. I prayed for my dad to be alive, and he died. Praying is for losers. Ryan Reynolds is just listening in while Melissa George is like, no one's ever going to replace your dead father. Susan sucks. I'll never let Susan replace my dead dad. He was awesome. Also, what are those massive blood splatters on the wall over there? You know what never mind i'm sure it has to do why susan sucks so much and she'll never replace my dead dad melissa george goes back to the master bedroom where ryan reynolds is waiting for her. Mm -hmm. real loaded question because he knows the answer to this it's a real like attorney move he's like so how's billy the worst kid we've got <laughs> before she can really get into it with him her mom calls he picks up the phone and he says the ryan reynolds melissa george residence how can i help you and we hear this voice on the other end say is this susan put my daughter on the phone how do you know about that name already? Billy is right. You stuck. I hate this. Hey, it's your mom. By the way, do you feel cold in here? And so this is the beginning of George Can't Keep Warm, which is another thing that I think is much better and creepier in the original. I think tonally and visually, the house feels colder than it does in this movie yeah when you watch it you get that sense of discomfort and james Rowland does a good job of looking sick the entire movie like he is both cold and about to throw up he looks like he's got all of the flus at the same time <laughs> yeah it's a real covid amityville <laughs> situation so while melissa george is on the phone ryan reynolds goes down to the basement to check on the furnace to feed the fire some this whole house is heated by wood and a furnace i assume so or coal so maybe that's why he's chopping so much wood well you know? yeah. he's trying to save on these energy bills and threatening the kids he hears something come out of the clock radio and he looks over, look, what? look over here and he realizes <laughs> that it's unplugged and it's like huh why that's a real how do you do so he just kind of wraps the cord around the clock radio and tosses it aside and heads back upstairs but behind him chad the uh -oh. furnace fire flares because the wood caught fire and the devil or something especially the devil let's 
go to the part where these two have sex. Right. So th- that's what happens. He goes upstairs to really rail Melissa George around 3.15 Now She rails him, man. She takes off her clothes and just hops on top of him. All right. So she's going cowgirl with him. Right. And he's on the bottom just like, hey, boy, this is a real pleasant surprise. I really like that move with your hips there. Oh, my God. There's a hang girl behind you. Why is Jody the dead girl that we saw get killed at the beginning of the movie? She's hanging from a noose. And I was like, she was shot. She wasn't hung. Just out to scare people. That's all. She's doing a Beetlejuice. She's trying to scare them off. Like she's got the handbook for the recently departed and trying to scare them out of her house. After he freaks out and Melissa George climbs off of him, he's like, what's going on, George? You know, I just don't feel very well. Sorry about that. And I've lost my boner. It's not coming back tonight. Let's just call this one a wash. We get to the next day and Melissa George is outside stringing up a line to hang clothes for drying with her two sons and then upstairs in the house chelsea is talking with her imaginary friend jody Mm -hmm. who we see is the creepy dead girl hanging from the noose the night before and jody looks a lot like the girl from the ring her character is perpetually wet and she's almost black and white and when Melissa George comes up to check on Chelsea and she asks about Jody, like, who's Jody? Chelsea says, she's the girl who is in my closet. Mm-hmm. And unscarily, Chad, we see the dead Jody sitting in the rocking chair. The mom looks over and Chelsea has an etch a sketch in her hand. Uh-huh. And the mom says, Is that Jody? And she refers to this image on this etch a sketch that has been scribbled out. And it looks like abraham monkey lincoln from the end of tim burton's remake of planet of the apes as if it was drawn by someone who had their eyes closed it looks terrible how many fingers does mrs claus have and it's crap one time though i walked into a toys r us in our hometown <laughs> and i saw an etch a sketch that had the words big hairy pussy written on it oh yeah for a fast times callback and you know who did it i called up ben and I asked him if it was his handiwork, and he said it was. And I knew it was him. I just wanted him to know that I saw it out in the wild. You know how when you're talking to somebody on the phone, you can hear them smile? He <laughs> yeah. was so happy. <laughs> sure. Well, everybody likes their hard work to be recognized. Ben used to write Big Hairy Pussy on the windows of cars with shoe polish. I once saw him get out and write Big Hairy Pussy on a car that had been decorated for a wedding <laughs> with tin cans hanging off the back of it it was like his el barto it was done enough that it was shorthanded to did you give it the bhp and again you're right it's from fast times at ridgemont uh-huh. high when was it jed nelson when he's wiping off that mirror and those are the three words yeah. i remember just how funny it was that those three words just out in the wild indiscriminately was one of the funniest things for us as kids it was a simpler time oh boy was it ever don't get that on tiktok let's get back to our movie so abraham monkey lincoln is on this etch a sketch and chelsea's holding it and also this was the moment in the movie that i realized hey that's chloe grace moretz playing this youngest child because she looks like a six-year-old version of her Mm -hmm. it's kind of like when you watch the music man and you're like is that ron howard it is funnily enough i've watched one of those two movies and it ain't the music man you've never seen the music man Uh, no i don't like musicals oh that's right and you don't much care for ron howard movies (laughs) right at least where he stars in them or robert preston who (laughs) before he died owed me 50 bucks how have they not done a remake of the last starfighter oh it's got if that's in the is works it, oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it really feels like that should have come out 10 years ago some kid and like it has a, a partnership with sony or microsoft give it time we're right around the corner from never ending story they're about to release that you know what i've heard it's going to be fantastic and it's available for streaming on disney plus which i encourage <laughs> everyone sure. to subscribe to. i mean if it makes you feel any better i'll be watching hocus pocus 2 next weekend i will not <laughs> we watched the original with the kids the other night that's not a good movie the missus really likes it and look my wife loves it yeah all right she's doing a whole hocus pocus trick or treat thing this year Mm -hmm. i'm just trying to understand why does one of them look like she had a stroke kathy to jimmy yeah Yeah. i don't know is it a great movie no is it a bad movie yes (laughs) but the kids kind of like that one this is another just complete tangent so we don't have to talk about this movie so after that though they were like hey we think we like halloween movies do you have another one 
that isn't that one. Coraline. We didn't do oh. Coraline. We did the Monster Squad, which really, fe- yeah. Well, you know what? When it comes to movies about Halloween, you can't go wrong when you involve the Holocaust and virgins. The Holocaust they went right over their head. They just had no idea what the number on the <laughs> arm was. Kids! Right. Why would? <laughs> so I stopped that, and then when the Holocaust thing makes its appearance, I stopped Monster Squad, and then we watched The Triumph of the Will, and then we went back. Schindler's List. Ken Burns documentary. <laughs> and then went back to Monster Squad. And I was like, now you have a deeper appreciation for this offhanded line that he, that scary German guy had in the movie. And then Dracula showed up. And then we went back. I stopped it there. And then we watched the Todd Browning Dracula as well as a number of other versions. They talked about the virgin. So we watched the 40-year-old virgin. But I got to say, Monster Squad landed well. They really liked it. Does it hold up? I, I never was crazy about it. But it, it was right for their age, right? They're 10 okay. and 11 and, and that's kind of the sweet spot for you that should watch movie. monster house over monster squad Coraline, monster house and paranorman all on the list coming up you know that football player he's gay and paranorman you might want to maybe go do a little bit of uh my own private idaho yeah sure or broke back mountain as a little bit of homework before you watch paranorman <laughs> I, I like my own private idaho i think that's where we're gonna start <laughs> Feck. <laughs> The things that they liked about Monster Squad, one, a scary German guy. And they, the the line where he sneaks up on him and they do that hard cut to inside the house where he says, and now the time has come to get some more pie. Like that really won him over. Sure. But the thing that really sold the movie for me this time mm-hmm. was how they reacted when Frankenstein gets sucked into the vortex at the end of that movie. Because they were like, what the fuck is this? Frankenstein is the good guy he's helping him out and he's going to this hell dimension it's like yeah he is they're like that's not how this works he's a good guy did you explain to them that it's Frankenstein's monster? I was really nitpicky <laughs> about all of that stuff. As you know, all children love. They love to be corrected and they, they love to be didactic. They were beside themselves that a hero of the movie died or disappeared. It, it was really something to watch because I was like, oh, right. You guys have been watching like Disney movies and that shit yeah. doesn't fly. You know, you know what you should do? You should have them read Crime and Punishment. Well, actually, we're going to start with War and Peace in, in our Russian novel series we're gonna have him watch reds the warren Beatty movie with shirley mclean a tale of two cities <laughs> there's not a better example <laughs> of the most likable heroic character giving his life for others i mean come on that really obscure forrest gump cut where he also gets aids <laughs> she had it yeah that one night they had sex and not only did she get pregnant yeah. he got aids and it turns out Bo, their child has aids yeah i didn't think that i could get it as a <laughs> man gump and company and aids so chelsea says that this scary drawing <laughs> that she's done of the 16 figure oh, yeah. mrs claus melissa george asked her about it and she says i'm not supposed to talk about her because she's an a-hole you're not supposed to say that word like what what a strict house your kid can't say a-hole my house we can say a-hole b-hole c-hole d-hole and we don't have to just use the letters we use the actual words michael finds ryan reynolds outside chopping wood yeah. and He's like, I found this horse harness or something. And Ryan Reynolds is like, wait a second. Where did you find that? I found it in the basement. You son of a bitch. It's not the basement. That's my office. So I want you to stay out of there from now on. Do you hear me? You piece of shit. And the kid's like, whoa, what the, what? Day one. And Ryan Reynolds is already like, I'm going to kill all of you. But he leans in and hugs Michael. And they do a good job of letting Ryan Reynolds exude his natural charm, Mm -hmm. at least for the first first 40 minutes of this movie and then kind of goes down the bananas path as opposed to like in the original movie when george lutz starts chopping wood with an axe it looks like he's got all of the allergies i mean his (laughs) face is puffy his eyes are bugging out and he also in the original movie he wears the same clothes for all 28 days he doesn't take a shower he's always moist (laughs) It's really unpleasant, but it works. He wears the same gray sweatpants and t-shirt to that wedding uh-huh. after the money disappears. That's yeah. a whole detour where you're like, what are we doing over here in this area? And what about the statue biting somebody? All right, whatever. I also just want to point out, just for the sake of when things happened in time, that the book, The Amityville Horror, came out about six or seven months after Stephen King's book, The Shining. And both of these stories are about 
father types Mm -hmm. who move into a haunted building, you know, house, and they kind of go bananas and try to kill their family. And I just want to ask you, Bo, do you think that The Shining, could it have influenced the book, The Amityville Horror, or is that too tight of a window? No, for sure. For sure. The book was a big hit. Like, Carrie was a big hit, and so The Shining was, you know, read by many. And, yeah, I, I think it's entirely possible that The Shining was influential. Yeah. Just like The Exorcist was. I mean, you can see hints of a lot of these outside sources of these kind of pop, pop culture the devil's gonna get you that was a big story. thing man i don't know if it was either just the, like catholicism or what but from you know like you said the exorcist and this and the omen and oh, what else like rosemary's baby i'm trying to think whatever else it was just like like the devil's gonna get you <laughs> i think it like, comes from the hangover of the 60s and 70s you think charles manson and like that kind of counterculture movement of rejecting the established norms of either society or organized religion all of the 60s was about that you had the gay revolution and the women's revolution and and drug culture and free love paranorman came out right and there was that they talk about in rosemary's baby but that time magazine cover saying god is dead Uh and and all of that was the genesis of the satanic panic because the pendulum just swings right like that it, it swung hard to atheism and exploring the idea this kind of existentialist idea of living in a world without religion and then you had the reaction as the 70s gave way to a national hangover where people were like oh man god's gonna be so angry at us for what we've been up to and then AIDS showed up Mm -hmm. and forrest gump got it in the director's cut the devil told me that i was gonna waste away to nothing melissa george she pulls up in her car to disrupt this pseudo violent slash touching moment between between Ryan Reynolds and Michael, the middle child. And Melissa George, she pops out of the car and she says, I found a babysitter off of this board at the grocery store. I'm sure it's totally legit. <laughs> you know, it's that place where creeps and perverts list their services at reasonable prices, including watching your children while you're gone. Speaking of children, where's my, I mean, our, but mostly my youngest child, Chelsea. Chelsea, Chelsea. And they're looking around for the dog is just, row, 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 row. this movie goes from zero to 90 real fast as this dog is barking so they find her finally in the boathouse standing on the bow of the boat and they're like whoa whoa, whoa. what are you doing in here you could drown and she's like jody wanted to see the boat and she's holding a single red balloon which is what creepy because of it like why is she holding this balloon here Mm, i don't know but it comes back later so i guess get used to it Uh so ryan reynolds thinking ahead you know (laughs) quick thinking puts a padlock on the boathouse door so that the kids can't get in there and drown themselves and then he gives a meaningful look up to the house as it stares down at him mm-hmm. all malevolent and whatnot we cut to late night and michael the middle child he wakes up to go take a piss and the house somewhat rattles and there's some creepy noises and this kid heads down to the bathroom and he looks out the window at the boathouse and the doors seem to open a bit despite the fact that we just saw a lock get put on it and then michael walks over to the toilet to take a piss and he kind of looks like what i imagine kermit the frog would look like if he was peeing in a human toilet he's all (laughs) bow-legged and real squat and then michael does something shocking in that he stops to wash his hands after peeing in the middle of the night which no child and let's be honest few adults take time to do this when he goes to wash his hands though instead of water it's just this black bile drooling monster it looks like grown-up Gollum pops up over his shoulder you're like who the hell is this troll man does he see the monster or does he just like get a little like and then runs back to his bed i think he gets a glimpse and then runs back to the bed but then all the windows pop open ryan reynolds wakes up and he has this vision of himself standing over the kids beds hey look before you get ahead of yourself when he gets out of bed bo he's walking through this house we gotta paint a picture with our words here oh yeah he's wearing old man sleep pants Mm -hmm. and no shirt and he is showing off an eight pack and ryan reynolds is ripped he has been since like the year 2000 and still is it's crazy. this was the movie that i was like what happened to ryan reynolds he looks like a superhero i was like shit i gotta up my wood chopping regiment asap that's what nothing but chopping wood and thinking about murdering kids will get you is a bod like that <laughs> he wanders through this house you know, like shutting windows and stuff goes to the foot of one of the kids beds and i think it's michael's and he's like 
don't worry, it's fine, pal. And then levels a gun at himself, like a rifle, and pulls the trigger. At which point he does a the sneaky double wake up. Oh, and it's 3.15. Yeah. So, uh-oh, 3.15 a.m. Weird stuff happens in this house. And so he looks out the window, sees this boathouse door open. And the red balloon that Chelsea had floats out of it. So he's like, son of a bitch, that girl is just determined to drown herself. And the dog, I don't remember his name. The dog is barking. It's Harry. That's right. Dogs are Harry. I can remember that. Harry the dog. Yeah. So Harvey's barking outside. Uh Uh-huh. And so Ryan Reynolds runs down to the boathouse to save Chelsea. And he just dives into the water after seeing some air bubbles float up. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Reynolds, he swims around in this lake. It looks like a swimming pool and he gets out of the water he heads back up to the main house and on his way he looks up at these creepy windows and he sees jody the black and white dead girl from the ring and then he looks over into a second window and here he sees chelsea and then behind her is now jody the ghost girl Mm -hmm. so it's like what's going on we got ghost girls popping up in all the windows i specifically said no ghost girls when we signed the contract on this house and so he runs upstairs but sure enough chelsea's just in bed looking as if she has been asleep the whole time yeah so he kind of does a cursory search of the room including the closet but when he walks into the closet we see jody the ghost girl up above him on the ceiling being grabbed by a bunch of ghost hands and he doesn't see this he just grabs the stuffed animal that jody had yeah the teddy bear right and kind of tucks it into bed with chelsea this has nothing to do with nothing it's just there to be an interesting visual yeah it all feels very influenced by the ring which was incredibly popular at the time this movie came out and rightfully so the ring's a a great movie the original japanese film is amazing the the remake is very very good hence will not be on this show right either one of those you watch gore verbinski our our pal with uh, all them pirates movies he did that Mm -hmm. morning comes and melissa george wakes up and finds that ryan reynolds is missing from bed which is disappointing because of what we talked about with that bod that he's got rocking so he is in the basement where the dog Hephaestus is digging (laughs) at the wall and Melissa George finds him down there and she's like George what are you doing down here and he's like I gotta tell you Melissa George this is the only warm place in the house it's the only place I can keep warm the rest of this place it's filled with cold and awful kids and people that I want to shoot did you look on the ground there's this tiny little trough it's about two inches deep it's perfect for the transfer of blood from a human sacrifice did you ever notice that anyway I'm warm down here and she says oh i'm sorry ryan reynolds and he goes how about you don't talk to me like one of your stupid fucking kids and she's like huh that's right billy's dog harold has been Uh keeping me up and i found the keys to the boathouse in billy's room and i think that billy's dog harvey he went down to the boathouse he grabbed the keys out of billy's room he opened the lock got into the boathouse and he filled a red balloon with helium released it when he knew i was looking out the window of the house he drank all of my good beer and he sat in my boat and he barked till i came down to see his prideful disrespect on full display and then that dog had the gall to return back up to billy's room and leave the keys that billy originally stole that led to this dog Hieronicus doing all the stuff that i just said i'm gonna go and have a talk with billy in the next scene and this is where we get that two of three inserts the day 15 Oh, okay, good. We're more than halfway through our movie. We're in the truck with Ryan Reynolds and Billy. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Reynolds is like, look, I'm not going to be angry. I just want you to apologize for fucking with my keys. You suck. I'm not apologizing for something I didn't do, Susan. They pull into the house and ryan reynolds is like well then pal guess you're unloading all these logs that we've got in the back of the truck so up and at them this sucks this suck everything sucks this wood sucks unloading it sucks dude just to again paint a picture with our words billy is this dark-haired greasy little kid who's always wearing this denim jacket vest yeah and it's covered with kiss logos and patches it's pretty sweet he looks like a little shit kid yeah he does (laughs) and so inside melissa george is kind of bouncing around the kitchen and Uh the letters the magnetic letters they have on the fridge start to slide together to form the words catch them and kill them that sounds kind of like cars halloween special starring toe mater Uh on his way to some open mic stand up on october 31st where his stage fright becomes a real fright bow and he gets up the nerve to spin his hilarious folksy yarns in an effort to kill get it the 
audience with laughter, you know? <laughs> Get her done. You know, catch him, kill him. Friday night, 8, 7 central. I don't care who you are. That's funny. Ugh, I've suddenly lost all interest in doing this podcast. Years ago when they were doing the roast of Larry the Cable Guy, Greg Giraldo, God rest his soul, yeah. from dying of a crippling drug overdose. Yeah, he's funny though. What a funny dude. He got so wrapped up in how pissed off he was at Larry the Cable Guy. He just looked over at him and he was like, how are you so fucking popular? <laughs> Yeah, I need to go back and watch some Greg Giraldo stuff. He's a funny dude. Who would have thought that a touring road comedian was so troubled? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe Mitch Hedberg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Patrice O'Neill. I saw Mitch Hedberg like two, three weeks before he died. Really? I didn't and know that. Yeah. When it, the word came out, guess who wasn't shocked? <laughs> the guy who had seen the show where mitch hedberg was barely conscious it was good it was funny but it was like oh mitch hedberg is not but i was younger i was like i bet he was drunk and it's like no 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 that was that was gank i was working at a planet hollywood in houston texas when chris farley came in for the grand opening he was wearing a leather jacket that they gave him from the merch shop and he looked like a tick about to pop and about i don't know three weeks later he died somebody told me that and i was like that sounds Sounds about right. I saw him and he was not long for this earth. And there are a couple of those celebrity deaths where you're like, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> not a stunner. So Melissa George turns around, sees these letters on the refrigerator and uh -huh. in walks Ryan Reynolds. And she's like, George, did you do that? And he looks at the refrigerator and all the letters are mixed up again. And he's like, what are you talking about? What? No, I didn't scramble those letters like that. And she's like, huh? We go to the big date night referenced earlier by Melissa George when she said she found a babysitter. And so Ryan Reynolds and Melissa George are going out on the town and they're waiting for this babysitter to show up. And Billy is like, I don't need a babysitter. You guys suck. This is bullshit. I'm 12 years old. I've got nine deeply rooted pubes. I can take care of myself and those two other kids that I sometimes see in this movie. I refuse to let a babysitter in this house. I will not. I cannot. I shan't not let this babysitter into this home. Bum, 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 bum. In walks Lisa, <laughs> the sexy babysitter. My musical note was bum, bum, <laughs> or Hodford teacher, whatever you want, because Ryan Riddles opens the door, and this woman who looks like a barely legal prostitute walks in with her boobs out and her tight shirt and her shorts up her ass, and she's doing Kegel exercises and bending in ways that people shouldn't be able to bend, especially in front of a 12 year old boy with nine deeply rooted pubes. And Ryan Reynolds looks at this shitty kid and says, Are you sure you don't want a babysitter, pal? Oh, pal. Chicka chicka. <laughs> and Ryan Reynolds is like, hey, how about we give you a quick tour in your whatever you call that outfit? Uh, I used to sit for the family that used to live here. I'm sure you probably haven't told your kids about them. Don't worry. I'll fill them in on all the horrific details after you leave. Go. Have a good time. I'll ignore your kids. I'll probably do some drugs. I'm going to drink any booze that I find. Bye-bye now. Go. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So they take off to dinner, and almost immediately, Ryan Reynolds is like, you know what? Ever since we left that hell house, I've been feeling a lot better. Better. Cut to Lisa, the sexy babysitter, smoking a bong in the bathroom, Chad. And when she's done, she puts it back in her purse, which that's going to spill and go everywhere. Oh. And if you've ever spilled bong water, it ain't good. No, all right? no, no. No. And also, the stench of smoking weed, it does just disappear. They're, these parents are going to come home and it's going to smell like a Taco Bell drive through at 2 a.m. in Seattle. Babe. Ryan Reynolds is going to beat the ever-living shit out of Billy. For stealing his weed that he hides <laughs> under the mattress. That was for me and your mom. That's how she comes. <laughs> Billy shows up with a bowl of popcorn outside of the bathroom where his babysitter is getting out on the inside. And he's like, yeah, that sucks. I mean, getting high without food, that is. You want some snacks? And these two go to Billy's bedroom. Well, it's Billy and Michael's bedroom. And the babysitter, again, her boobs are out. She's just like lounging around Mrs. Robinson, age what, 18 in a day. Hey, are you trying to seduce me, Lisa? That would suck. <laughs> She looks over at Billy and she's like, so, uh, do you French? Do you kiss with your tongue? And Billy's like, uh, that sucks. I mean, kissing with tongue. No, I don't use like, my tongue when I kiss. I use my lips. That's how you kiss. Sometimes you use my eyelashes for butterfly kisses. Sometimes the tip of my nose for Eskimo kisses, but I don't kiss it with my tongue. That's weird. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. 
I mean, the French and sure, but hey, did you know about the DeFeos that used to live there? No, that sucks. Tell me. I mean, you're a little young, but I'm a little stoned, so I think it's okay to tell you. Sure, that sucks. So... There was this guy named Ronnie. Uh Uh-huh, did he suck? Well, yeah, he sucked all right. He killed his dog and was starting to hear all kinds of voices. And then he thought these voices were telling him that his family was a bunch of demons or something. His family probably sucked too, but go on. I'm listening. And then Michael comes in and... Hey, guys, wait, what are you guys talking about? Are you talking about anybody that never lived in our house? I'd love to hear a story like that. You cover your ears and i'm gonna finish my horribly graphic story so older kid that hasn't french before i can still hear you yeah yeah yeah. it's fine so he went around this house this ronnie defeo motherfucker with a gun wait wait wait. you said this house you mean the house that he lived in yeah wait which house this house oh yeah that's right the house that we live in Uh uh-huh wait and so (laughs) He went around the house, and this guy killed both of his parents in the room that your parents are now in. Well, that sucks. Then they came to this very room. Wait, the one we're in right now? That's right. And Ronnie DeFeo killed two kids in here. How many kids normally stay in this bedroom? It's two. It's me and the kid over there with his little hands over his ears. I can still hear you guys. Oh, yeah. It's almost one-to-one. It's so close, it's freaking me out. So, anyway, they had brains and blood splattered all over over this room look on this wall there's brain splattered still here do you think that's those kids brains i wouldn't be surprised here let me have a taste (laughs) oh yeah that's brains all right (laughs) hand me my little genie bottle and that lighter We get a glimpse of Melissa George and Ryan Reynolds kind of chit-chatting at the restaurant. Everything's better because they're away from the house. And now they're leaving on their way back. Uh Meanwhile, Lisa, the shitty but sexy babysitter, is just taking them on a murder tour of the house. It's like a ghost tour that you paid for the VIP experience. You're going to get to see where they were killed. And so they go all the way up to the attic room, which is where Chelsea's bedroom is and where Jody was killed at the beginning of the movie. And Chelsea says, Jody says you're a bad babysitter. And Lisa's like, oh, yeah. Well, I'm sure she would if she could, but that bitch is dead. And Billy at this point is like, hey, even though you suck, I dare you to go in the closet. And you suck if you don't. And so she's like, all right, how about this? You give me that sweet ass kiss poster that you got on your wall and you got yourself a deal, my little friend. Done deal. But I get to keep your panties. You know what? It's a fair deal. She goes into this closet and Chelsea is like, you're gonna make Jody mad. And as soon as Lisa gets fully inside this closet, the door slams shut and she is trapped inside, starts yelling for the door to be unlocked. And Chelsea's Etch-A-Sketch gets in on the action yep by spelling out the word hate her so lisa turns around in this closet and sees jody ghost jody standing there with the bullet hole in her head and she says look what ronnie did and then grabs lisa's finger and sticks it in the bullet hole in her head Uh uh-huh at which point this sexy babysitter screams her lungs out and turns around and starts pounding on the door until her hands are bloody she kind of goes bananas in the original movie it's done better yeah because first off the babysitter isn't sexy i think she has external braces gear <laughs> on her head she has yeah the dental head gear where she's like you guys let me out of this closet she doesn't have it coming yeah she's just sort of someone who showed up to watch these three rotten kids right and so when it happens it's more frightening and the way that she bangs on the door and just her panic and fright it's just more intense in this it's a little goofy and even having jody be in the room with her and sticking her finger inside her bullet hole head it's a little cartoonish in a way right it's a little too much yeah you know it's uh, you're turning it to 11 when this scare needs to be about a six you know not everything has to be the grossest thing you ever saw the original has more in common with george c scott's the changeling i don't know if i can attribute that to george c scott but less is more in certain instances and i think in the original movie even though they really go over the top in some weird ways it's strange in this movie we'll get to in a moment how little flies are introduced into this film whereas in the original movie and even in the book literally in the book flies are slowly introduced as this element of fear Mm -hmm. or evil or something like that in this they just show up and it's like bugs when you get the description of jody who is completely 
invisible in the original movie the only thing you hear is that she looks like a pig and she's got red eyes well that's rude i mean no, no child well you know we called a pig she is fond of the brownies she's husky yeah she's big boned <laughs> but there's that one scene in the movie where i think it's margot kidder looks out the window and sees a pair of like pinpoint red eyes staring back that yeah. quickly go away and it's kind of terrifying because you've built up to that and haven't seen anything you've kind of filled in this pig demon in your mind and so all you need to see are the red eyes for that to land I think the original movie is too reliant on the source material there because the book was so popular, like the little demon dog statue that bites him mm. and the component where the mom turns into an old woman and the pig demon in the window, like all of those things are there. But if you just watch that movie and if you didn't read the book, which a lot of people who saw that movie did read the book, all of those components are in there. When you just watch it for the first time with no knowledge of the source material, it's a bunch of weird shit that just happened. But that's also kind of what I like about it is there, there's an air of authenticity in that where if it's truly a haunted house that's kind of inexplicable but evil, then it would just be a bunch of shit that happened that you didn't totally understand but reached a point where you realize like, I've got to get out of here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Except for the walls bleeding yeah. and then the big poop cesspool that he falls into right. at the end. The gateway to hell or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's just, that's silly. They ran out of money, it looks like. <laughs> it, it gets over the top in, in a way that doesn't do the movie any favors but it's still even at that point it's more restrained than this one this one's more influenced by what audiences were expecting at the time this movie comes out right. so our babysitter she beats on the walls of the door so hard that her hands turn to bloody nubs and she goes bananas and it's like a real burr, 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 you know moment they, they take her out on a stretcher and she's like she was supposed to be dead there's no coming back there's no coming back and ryan reynolds and and his wife they go in to dress down billy and michael and ryan reynolds says it's not fun to pull a prank on somebody and hurt them and billy says you suck susan we didn't hurt anybody it's this weird house oh by the way she told us that two kids were killed in the beds that we sleep in hello did you two jackasses know this what is wrong with you this is deranged talk about a prank gone wrong susan this is the point where ryan reynolds really turns the corner uh -huh. and he says you know what from now on i'm doing all the disciplining in this house first of all listen to what your mother said and get your asses upstairs and go to bed yeah, you suck i'm not sleeping in that room another night how about you do me a favor wipe those stupid looks off your faces and go to bed get your asses into that bedroom right now like, oh shit he means business you better go upstairs sleep in the death room later melissa george goes to check in on chelsea and yeah, where's she been in the movie eh, just <laughs> hanging out and she says so what happened to this babysitter and uh -huh. chelsea says jody didn't like lisa and the man who lives here makes jody do bad things but jody says he likes you jody says you're a good mommy mm -hmm. well that sounds great me being a good mommy but who's this bad man <laughs> so day 16 or 17 or 18 or we don't know 21 or 22 whatever yeah so but it's daytime and ryan reynolds is chopping wood to keep himself in the greatest shape any human being has ever been what's he wearing bo sleep pants and nothing else yeah. <laughs> and he's making these kids stack up the wood as he chops it while yeah. melissa george just watches from the window ryan reynolds makes billy stay outside after dark while they're all <laughs> eating dinner to yeah. finish stacking this wood and he's being real surly and shit and melissa george is angry at him about torturing billy uh-huh and when she's complaining about this treatment that billy is getting ryan reynolds goes huh well i guess that billy's dad isn't around to teach him anything on account of being dead and by the way you're welcome for that life insurance check he says to her when the body suffers the spirit flowers that's what my dad always taught me and then we cut to michael and billy later that evening and they're chit-chatting and ryan reynolds is eavesdropping which he does a lot in this movie and he's listening to these two kids talk through the, the heating vents and michael says why is Susan such a jerk and billy says susan isn't a jerk he's a douchebag and also there's a deep voice that he he's hearing 
hearing saying, catch him, kill him. You're done. Bag him. That's funny. No matter who you are. Oh, Get, God. Buy some Prilosec. <laughs> and he touches this wood <laughs> that's hiding the room we'll get into in a minute. And suddenly he has a vision of himself inside this room and he sees blood flowing through these trenches that we saw earlier in the rock. And as he approaches this kind of stone table, he sees that there's a body on that table. And then the body turns to face him and he realizes that it's him partially flayed. Kind of like when Luke Skywalker went in that cave. Yeah. And Darth Vader was him. It's like that, but if Darth Vader's belly was split open. And this dream Ryan Reynolds on the table says, kill them. And he wakes up. Catch him, kill him. That gum. You're my best friend, Lightning McQueen. We cut to Ryan Reynolds just <laughs> yakking in the bathroom and running himself a hot bath. And there's a whole bit of business here where he gets in the tub and some arms grab him and try to pull him under the water. And he's uh, like, enough of that. yeah, he tries to get out, but it, Melissa George finally comes in and kind of pulls him out while he screams and goes cray cray. Cut to Ryan Reynolds at a doctor's office. And this doctor's like, mm, so uh, Mr. Ryan Reynolds, do you do drugs? And he's like, uh, no. Do you have headaches? Nausea, upset stomach, diarrhea. Have you tried Pepto-Bismol? Uh, no, no, no. Yes, no. Here's a note to go see a psychiatrist because I think you're kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And he's like, my shift's over. See you later, potato. And the doctor just leaves. I don't have the education to diagnose you entirely but i think that i'm within my rights to say that you are <laughs> cuckoo, cuckoo. so they're on their way home and melissa george is like this is totally my fault we never should have bought this house it's too much and he's like no 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 sugar buns it's not your fault we have the american dream now this is everything we ever wanted and we're gonna make this work no matter what back at the house billy is serving some super sugar smacks to yeah. up the authenticity of the 1970s and make me jealous his little sister chelsea says can i go up and get my teddy bear he's hungry too and billy's like you suck yeah go get your teddy bear who sucks too so off she goes to get her teddy bear ryan reynolds and melissa george they return home and ryan reynolds goes to walk in the house and from up in the sky the teddy bear falls to the ground and then melissa george and ryan reynolds they look up and on top of this four-story home they hear the voice hi mommy and it's chelsea standing on the edge of the rooftop so melissa George, the mom, she freaks out. She runs inside, goes up to the third or fourth floor, climbs out a window, and hustles up to the roof to save her kid. Ryan Reynolds grabs his ladder because he does a job that involves a big ladder, and he climbs up the outside. And I will say, this scene looks pretty good. I tried to identify the seams of green screen or practical effects, but having this little girl standing on the precipice of this very tall house and putting herself in danger, it worked for what it was. It's probably the best scene of the movie except when the credits roll that was my favorite thing <laughs> they finally get her down uh, melissa george catches her and her overalls her oshkosh bagashes break and she falls and but ryan riddled saves her bow so our bad guy's a good guy they finally get her on solid ground and melissa george is asking her like why would you do that and she says well jody wanted me to go with her she said that i could stay here and play forever so jody also apparently promised this girl that that Chelsea could see her dead father. Right. And while <laughs> Melissa George is like trying to get her back to normal and calm her down. The greatest scene of this whole movie happens. It, it's so good. Ryan Reynolds comes around the corner listening to all of this and <laughs> he just goes, what's the matter with you people? And he just wanders off and says, wacko family. It's the biggest laugh of the movie and it is 100% unintentional. It's not supposed to be funny, but it's wonderful wonderful what's the matter with you people you people are all a bunch of maniacs <laughs> and so he decides at this point he's just moving down to the basement to be away from all these people uh -huh. so he's got his clock radio down the basement he fires up the furnace right. he's got his stack of pornography jugs we cherry all of the classic 70s pornography bow makes himself comfy on the couch down there as well it's not the worst rec room that i've ever seen it's an early jack shack there are going to be some spiders let's just yeah. get real about that but other
other than that, it's probably fine. Melissa George goes to a church to talk with a priest as played by Philip Baker Hall, who you mentioned in the introduction. He's illegally burning some leaves on the lawn, yes. We last saw him in The Rock, season 19, episode 6, if you're interested. It, I want to say it is very curious how little priests and the Catholic Church are used in this movie because the original is chock full of priests and catholicism there are priests everywhere s plural here she just shows up at this church and she's like father philip baker hall there's something evil in my house and philip baker hall says there was a family that had a similar problem and she says was it the defeos oh you knew them no i'm living in their house dun dun then we get a shot that is my second favorite moment in the movie where ryan reynolds is chopping wood but to accomplish this task he has shitty kid billy hold the logs in place mm -hmm. while he chops them just scaring the shit out of this kid go ahead hold it tight it's extreme william tell there is a feverish look in ryan reynolds eyes that suggests that he's not really aiming for the log uh, I think he closes his eyes when he swings that axe just to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, poor Billy. Oh, this really sucks. When he drops that axe, Billy instinctively releases it and he starts crying, you know, because he almost died. And Ryan Reynolds just grabs this kid by his face and his cheeks and pulls him in. He's like, why are you crying? Are you a baby? You need a diaper? You need your banky or your baba before you go nine nine? Grab a log. Hurry up, jackass. And Billy's just like, <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> so good he's like we're friends billy right call me susan again motherfucker i swear to god i'll split your head wide open <laughs> sorry i suck i'm the one who sucks and you suck susan i mean i suck <laughs> i know you've seen me shirtless kid you know that i can split you right in half I know, I know. Your stomach sucks, but in a good way. <laughs> so we go down in the basement where George is watching the home videos from the beginning of the movie, being nostalgic what? about two weeks ago. Like Chevy Chase hanging out in the attic. And as he's watching this movie, he goes, Billy's face gets all demonic. And he kind of runs it back and he's like, son of a bitch, that kid's a demon. And I just can't complain. <laughs> what all right once again he wakes up at 3 15 a.m all the windows in the house are open also the door is wide open yeah and, and so he grabs his axe and ryan reynolds heads to the boathouse which is once more open sure with balloons flying out left and right <laughs> so he goes inside and it's dark the lights aren't working and then some kind of monster comes at him i thought it was a mermaid something a young jason Voorhees could be anything could be the black lagoon uh creature <laughs> it could be anything that shape of water sexy fish it could be a little mermaid of a particular skin color that people on the internet are very upset about yeah oh, i mean if that isn't just a what is wrong with people the same thing with people say like i can't believe that there are black elves it's like i think as soon as you say the word elf you've basically undone your argument do these people realize jesus wasn't white no 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 okay no 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 like, no this is a real talladega nights like dear white baby jesus jesus christ did not look like a doobie brother he did not look like barry gibb no he looked more like a somali pirate probably very <laughs> similar to the i'm the captain now guy right that was closer than maurice gibb this monster comes at that gum and <laughs> Ryan Reynolds goes to town with this axe. Uh, in the boathouse to kill this mermaid uh -huh. monster. But it turns out not a real monster, no. Chad. It is, in fact, Hippocrates the dog. <laughs> and when he gets done with this thing, when the lights come up, it is a pile of bloody fur and entrails with a collar that is the biggest discernible feature of this once yeah. pet of the house. It looks like this dog was put inside of a slap chop. He spends the rest of his night just scrubbing the place clean to hide his sin <laughs> he chunked that dog in the lake like they should have done that baby t-rex kersploosh it's so funny and so the next morning he's sitting at breakfast just staring down at these hands that have now seen the blood of a dog hey hon have you seen the dog his name i've never said out loud <laughs> 
Uh, no, no. I don't know why my hands are shaking so much. Dog, when did we get a dog? We've never had a dog. And by the way, we own a house now. You can't run away from your problems. We have a mortgage. We have financial responsibilities. And then Ryan Reynolds grabs his wife's hand and he squeezes it way too tightly and she pulls it away. And he just looks at her and he says, how did you get so fucking stupid? Everything we have is in this house except for a dog that we've never had. Very ominously, he says, nobody is going anywhere. They start screaming at each other, having a real good married couple fight, and Billy and Michael rush in to see what these two are going on about. And Michael says, hey, we can't find the dog that we've always had anywhere. Can anyone remember the dog's name? And Ryan Reynolds says, look, the dog's name was Harry, according to the bloody dog collar I found in the boathouse. And before you ask, no, I haven't seen him. He probably ran away to the bottom of the lake. So stay out of the boathouse. <laughs> ran away to the bottom of the lake. While everybody's bitching at each other, this priest finally uh -huh. shows up. And it's like, there's eight minutes left in this movie. We're almost done. We're so close. Ryan Reynolds is screwing the window shut so they don't come up and as soon as father calloway aka philip baker hall runs into this place he clocks the stuffed animal with one uh -huh. eye and tells melissa george outside like that doll was jody defeo's where did you get that doll and she's like i don't know my kid just has it and he's like huh i knew the defeo's pretty well jody defeo was buried with that doll Anyway, uh, I'm going to run inside and get to the business of blessing this place. And this is another moment where the movie just cranks it to 11 when it doesn't mm -hmm. need to. Because as soon as he starts slinging holy water around this place, it's full on sizzling when it hits yeah, the floor. It's, it's like water on a hot skillet. You're like, what? He leans into this vent where he hears voices. And then instead of flies gradually collecting on him as the original did, which I, again, I think that seems really effective. In this one he just gets blasted in the face by a water hose of flies yes. and then we get the famous get out he's like <laughs> and he jumps in his car and vroom, off he goes dun, 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 yeah. Da, 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 yeah i mean he's gone melissa george is like chasing after him father Kelly, come back come back and then turns around to find Ryan Reynolds just standing there. Yeah. His descent into madness is on full display. We see him hearing voices and he hears dogs barking, which, bro, they never had a dog. And he goes down his basement and the TV comes on and we get that same Indian head test signal that Ronnie saw a year ago when he killed his whole family. And then Ryan Reynolds, he runs down to the boathouse and he hears more barking. And then a voice from the house says, catch him kill him that gum get her done <laughs> and then ryan reynolds oh, I hate that so <laughs> ryan reynolds falls to the ground outside and he just rolls around as his wife looks on assuming that he's been unable to score heroin to keep him even and then the movie tells us it's day 28 Bo. thank god right we're at the end of this ryan reynolds wakes up the next morning and immediately yeah, pukes. been there done that and then melissa george rushes to the public library and she bang bang bangs on the the door and this old lady librarian opens it up and she says we don't open for two whole minutes i'm like really someone's eager to use your library and you're not letting him in for two minutes es then don't open the door esther is drunk on power and bloody mary's if it's only two minutes you know what you do nothing you wait him out because it's only two minutes or you just open the door like a human being it is so stupid this is the research moment that we have in both movies although if memory serves it's been a while since i've seen the original but i feel like this happened earlier earlier in the I don't original. think it happens earlier. I think there's just more movie after it. So when she goes into this library, she cranks up the microfiche machine, which for those people under the age of 45, this was a machine that had film that took photos of newspapers and other printed material, and then it would enlarge them so that you could scroll through these old periodicals. It was a very inefficient, unsearchable version of the internet with no pornography, at least none that I could find when I used microfiche machines. You're going to the wrong library, uh, my I know. friend. So Melissa George, she's going through this machine and she looks up news on the murders from one year ago. And she's scrolling through, scrolling through. And then she goes in and she finds uh, stories about the murderer. And here she sees that voices told Ronnie to kill the family 28 days after they had moved into the house. And there is a photo of this book with the words, catch them, kill them. You're my best friend, Lightning McQueen. And she gets real spooked. Now, in the original movie, when Kathy Lutz does her research and she sees a picture of Ronnie, 
it is the twin to George Lutz, her husband. Like, it is James Brolin. And I want to also say, like, in the original movie, I feel like there's more time between the original murders and then moving into the house. I can't say that for certain, but it feels very, history is repeating itself. And so when she sees the guy who committed the murders, that he looks, it's not looks just like, it's James Brolin. It's the same guy. Yeah. But here, it's a different person. They kind of have a beard and bushy hair, which was the style. I'm like, well, maybe the house just has a type. And also in the original, there's that scene where James Brolin goes to the bar and the bartender is like, wow, you're yeah. the spitting image of somebody that used to come in yeah. here all the time. So it was like a thing. But there's also, because they dance around that, and then when you see that it's the same person, there's a creepy factor to it of like, not only yeah. are you in the same situation, you look just like this guy. Identical to it. Thematically is like, oh, well, then you are going to do the yeah. same thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think all of that stuff works better in the original, yeah. of course. Meanwhile, back at the house, Ryan Reynolds busts into this secret room finally. Yeah, he grabs a crowbar and he's like, I need to expand my man cave jerk off auditorium. Speaking of, it's all gooey inside, like it's a three musketeers. In it's there. nasty. He goes inside this room. There are maggots on the wall, which is gross. And then he grabs a sledgehammer and knocks down this wall. And then the movie cuts back to the library and our sleuth detective mom, Melissa George, she goes to the the card catalog and looks up the name Ketchum with a K the way Tomater spells it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there is a book that's written by the Reverend Jeremiah Ketchum. And it's the Chronicle of a Zealot, 1665. And uh, this guy, Ketchum, he was apparently like 26 years old when he became a zealot. Because when I was 26 years old, I was like bartending and paying off student debt. This guy was a real overachiever. When I was 26, I was right. just an alcoholic. <laughs> also, why would she look up this book? There's no reason for this. Yeah. Right. She I just is like, hey, what's this? Hmm, here's the book that relates to everything. So she opens up this book and she starts flipping through. And there are these illustrations that look just like her house. Okay. Okay. Ryan Reynolds back in the basement he's smashing down these walls and he finds these tunnels under his home that are filled with all of these holding cells and ryan reynolds starts hallucinating and sees all of these slaughtered captives in these cells he walks past the first holding cell and the person in there looks like the finale of a chris angel stage show he's like hanging from hooks that are pierced through his pectoral skin and then that grown-up golem that scared michael when he was peeing like kermit the frog in the bathroom he's in a holding cell and all of this sounds terribly confusing I'm sure, which it is because I have no idea what's going on in this movie either. I I think the idea is that this Catchem dude was murdering all these Native Americans. It's sort of a Poltergeist 2 scenario right. where he is kind of controlling all of their spirits to some degree and keeping them from moving on or whatever. Okay. They don't explain any of that, but all right, whatever. And again, none of this is in the original book. None of this is in the movie. This is all just a bunch of nonsense they throw in this remake to make it more intense or like something you've already seen before it's really putting a hat on a hat i don't need this much explanation for hey by the way this house is evil that's all i need to know melissa george she's in the library and she finds an illustration of reverend ketchum and in this book and it, apparently this is who her daughter was trying to etch a sketch when she drew president abraham monkey lincoln earlier and he committed suicide in their basement of the house whereas you said all these native americans were killed and you're like oh Okay, whatever. While she is looking this up, Ryan Reynolds sees an image of this guy in this subterranean castle that is beneath this house. Yeah. And has Melissa George been at the library all day? Because she got there early in the morning and then she mm -hmm. spent a lot of day researching. And also, where are your kids? Shouldn't they be in school? Because earlier Billy was supposed to go to school. It's the fall. This seems to be a overlooked detail. Nobody's going to school anymore, Chad. Not in this house. Melissa George, she runs over to the church again to see Reverend Philip Baker Hall and she says, why did you leave my house the other day? And he says, your house frightens me. That guy, Ronnie, the one who killed his whole family, he came to see me and said he heard voices. But I thought he was full of shit till yesterday. You should get your family out of that house. Goodbye. Why did you leave? I don't know. Scared. Right. I got a mouthful of flies. What do you yeah. think? Quite frankly, uh, I just didn't want to deal with it. It's, it seemed like a real bad scene. You know how much priest made? Not much. Sure. Not enough. Not to deal with that shit. I got a blast of flies right in my puss. And then I heard a demon voice. And it, uh, look, 
I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure this is what demon voice. Actually, what am I saying? I am an expert. I'm a fucking priest. <laughs> so I heard this demon voice say, get out. And so I did. Right. When a demon tells you to do something, you do it unless it's kill your family, which, by the way, is probably what's going to happen to your family. We get to Ryan Reynolds. He wakes up on his basement couch and the phone rings. It's Melissa George saying, get the kids out of the house. And Ryan Reynolds just rips the phone off the wall. I don't think he's going to get the kids out of the house, Bo. I think he is, but in a totally different way. Suddenly, Bo, it's nighttime and it's raining because that's uh -huh. that's a scarier atmosphere than daytime and sunshine. Melissa George, she returns home. She's screaming for her kids and Billy comes down and he says, Susan sucks. He's in the boathouse. Melissa George rushes down to the boathouse to find Ryan Reynolds looking in the water with a flashlight for dog remains. I don't know. And then Melissa George slips on what appears to be red jello, maybe some salsa mixed with dog innards, and she mm -hmm. falls in the water. And then her hair for some reason gets wrapped around the running propeller of this boat and then ryan reynolds he stops the rotating propeller and then lowers the trim on the motor to send her under the water and as soon as this scene of suspense starts it immediately ends because ryan reynolds just raises the motor back up and melissa george is freed but Bo, she is not happy no she calls him a psycho and runs off as she should and during this scene there is a shot of melissa george as an old woman that i mentioned earlier this happens in the book but if you don't know the book or the previous movie you're like why did she suddenly turn into an old lady underwater with her hair wrapped around the propeller of a speedboat don't worry about it we're about two minutes away from being done with this movie melissa george runs inside the house she finds chelsea in the basement and is like what are you doing down here honey and finds that ryan reynolds has also been busy that day building coffins <laughs> with their names on them he wrote them in sharpie and they're like paupers coffins but they're handcrafted yeah. they're made with love they're though. artisanal coffins no one's arguing <laughs> that but they're it's pretty chintzy you pick it up the weight of the body is really going to make the bottom fall right out it is the coffin equivalent of chelsea's picture of the ghost <laughs> down at the basement ryan riddles shows up and finds them both there and grabs chelsea and there's a little bit of a struggle and they get past them melissa george is wrangling the kids to get them out of the house but ryan reynolds has a gun down in the basement yeah. and so now it's chase time right. so he's gonna chase him through the house the house meanwhile doing its part all the doors slam shut the windows all the screws go back into the windows and keeps everyone corralled inside while george is stalking them I... and billy tries to mouth off a little bit you suck susan leave my mom alone Dude, he gives this kid an elbow to the gut to shut him up yeah down goes billy and so chelsea runs upstairs everybody runs George upstairs the kids the mom yeah. and so they climb out the window onto the roof good plan in a rain and lightning storm one of them's got a key tied to a kite <laughs> one of them's got a big piece of sheet metal above their head this will keep us safe go stand next to that tall skinny tree <laughs> i ran to the biggest tree i could find <laughs> meanwhile ryan reynolds is just popping off a couple of shots through the roof just to see if he gets one by happenstance right. and he runs out of ammo so he comes out onto the roof and billy whacks him in the skull good with a pipe that sends him falling into the mud below soft pillowy mud so he's not hurt yes though. Right, he's just really dirty, but in kind of a sexy way. Sure, take off that shirt. Get yourself a mud pie. <laughs> I wouldn't mind a slice of. <laughs> so George tries to get the kids back in through a window, but inside is this Catchem ghost. Yeah, the Reverend Catchem. He's like, take them. Like, oh, you gotta stay outside. Get her done. <laughs> and so they're climbing down this ladder that's attached to the chimney, or a bunch of bars, you know, that form a ladder. Why didn't they use that to climb up to save Chelsea earlier? When this shows up in the movie. I'm like, why is this not being used all the time? I don't know. Why don't all chimneys have ladders like that? I was like, that seems like a real miss. But anyway, I'm not going to deal with 18th and 19th century <laughs> masonry best practices. Right. Can't deal with architecture right no, now because no, no, we've no. got 90 seconds left in this movie. Ryan Reynolds, he comes back to life and he grabs his trusty dog killing axe and goes after the family. Ryan Reynolds grabs Billy. And before Ryan Reynolds can split this kid's head in two, Melissa George has inexplicably found ryan reynolds shotgun she cocks it on her husband and she says back the fuck up and then he takes the gun barrel and puts it to his forehead at first i thought he was gonna put it in his mouth it's a real like you you've got to kill me kind of thing yeah which here's the thing shoot him just shoot him yeah it's like chunking that baby t-rex in the water from the last episode just do it and we're done but she's thinking about all that good good that she got from him 
prior to them moving into I this house so. and she's like eh, i'm not ready to give that up yet it's raining his shirt is like laid against his rippling abs that mud is like accentuating it she's like mm, mama can't say no maybe if i just let him kill one kid no 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 we, we can't do that and so she ends up hitting him with the butt of the rifle knocking him out and yep. he doesn't stay out very long because he wakes up pretty quick and punches her in the gut with an axe he splits her belly with the axe and yeah. you're like what he just killed her that wasn't in the original and then the movie's like mm, just kidding he didn't really kill her it was a mini dream it's such a head fake and i hate it to have him do this so there are stakes to what's going on in, in the movie because surprise surprise nobody dies in this movie except the people at the very beginning of the movie you know what you're right and that's not what i want out of a movie called the amityville horror that's crazy i didn't even think about that nobody does damn this movie's not very good no so ryan reynolds is like melissa george you've got to kill me so i won't hurt you or the kids and she says no one's dying today and knocks him out again real good yeah and so this time they have the sense to tie him up she enlists the kids to drag him down to the boathouse to what toss him in the lake you know billy's right. like this guy sucks he tried to kill you mom he punched me in the gut susan's the worst the only person that died in this movie is my dog and that sucks we need to take this guy and chunk his body and let him just sink to the bottom of lake muerto canine who's with me where you can hang out for all eternity with hap yeah they throw ryan Reynolds on this boat and then just drive it off yeah, suddenly it's morning i haven't seen the sun come up and go down this quickly since the truman show after the sun rises they get the safe distance from the house the safe demon uh -huh. distance and he just wakes up uh, and they're uh, like are you cool and he's like ah we've got to get out of here so he just they let him go sure. and he's ready to drive the boat off and there's an insert on the screen that says they never went back for their shit I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. And then we get a shot of the house. Like the house kind of resets itself. The furniture goes back into place and the windows all snap closed or open or whatever. And then we get a shot of Jody in the home screaming. And this final shot has this frantic montage of all of these scenes from the movie. And it ends with Jody disappearing into the floor as two arms grab her ankles and yank her down, leaving behind her one eyed teddy bear. The end. That is the the end of the amityville horror 2005 and uh it just sucks this is a movie that with a little bit of editing could have been pg-13 oh yeah yeah yeah. From hell maybe it was i thought it was r but I think, uh, it feels like it was r but yeah I, I could have that wrong the problem with this movie is it's really a tale of two films it, it's too much and not enough all at once right it doesn't go far enough to be truly transgressive it's too silly and over the top with a lot of its scares and ryan reynolds is almost too likable i get yeah. what he brings to this role of seeing that transformation from likable character to horrible monster but it it almost softens it up again i know we've talked about the comparison to the original 70s version of this his character is hardcore the whole way through and he goes from being kind Kind of like a creepy shitty stepdad to a horrible stepdad although in the last five minutes of that film redeems himself and is a good guy this is like he starts out as a redemptive good guy descends into a horrible person and then they ride off in a speed <laughs> yeah yeah by the end of the movie james brolin is saving the dog he goes back to save his dog he didn't split yeah. his head open with an axe yeah. uh, there's just so much more in that original whether it's the friend that won't go in the house whether it's the priest that eventually goes blind and i think dies on the side of the road maybe or it just ends up in like an institution the house is evil reach is far beyond a hundred foot parameter around the property line it's sort of a situation of like if you set foot in the house you're kind of screwed uh -huh. and this movie has some of that but the priest character is entirely wasted like you could remove those philip baker hall scenes and it changes nothing about the movie i agree it doesn't matter the first one you get rid of the priest you got maybe an hour and seven minutes of a film it's full of <laughs> priests and catholics and statuary fallen trying to kill people the whole scene with the psychic about it, kind of establishing what the problem with the house is which isn't hey there was a dude who killed people on the property back in the 1600s or whatever it's just hey this thing sits on a gateway to hell 
And again, that's all you need. Like, don't overcomplicate your scary premise. Uh, because the, the point isn't the involved backstory of the haunting. The point is, let's set up a situation which we can do haunted house stuff. Yeah. But also, I think that when the original came out, audiences were more receptive to weird satanic nonsense. I think this movie leans more towards grounded traditional horror of the early aughts. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. It is very much of its time yeah. to be sure. You know, Bo, when you think about iconic horror movie franchises mm -hmm. that produce terrible remakes in the early 2000s, I got to tell you, you look no further than Friday the 13th. Ooh. And that is going to be our next episode. This is a movie that is both a reboot that also tries to pay homage to the origin story of that series. If we're discussing it on Pixar Six movies it is objectively not a very good film you know uh -huh. so we're well within our comfort zone on this one but when i think about jason Voorhees's life in the friday the 13th series he has done so much more than anything that i've really done because he went to summer camp he made a shrine to his mother with her severed head he shot a harpoon gun into a guy's eye mm -hmm. he got struck by lightning and lived Came to tell about life. it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he uh he survived being hung he got hit in the head with axes multiple times he went to Manhattan, which I've never done. He went to outer space. He battled a woman with telekinetic powers. He was the focus of an FBI SWAT team raid where they just blew his body to pieces and lived to tell mm -hmm. about it. He's lived Became like eight, he's, some yeah. kind of slug or something. Yeah. He's an amazing, iconic, cinematic icon. And the remake of this particular oeuvre of horror is incredibly flaccid when it comes to horror movie remakes, which makes it a perfect movie for episode two of this season's theme, Deja Vu, season 22. Don't forget to get your coffee mug, t-shirt, hoodie, and uh, baby onesie at our merch shop. You know, if you ever said to yourself, what would it be like if Jason Voorhees was a weed farmer? Uh -huh. Oh, are you in luck? Taking a page from our movie timeline, what would it be like if all of the teenagers in the movie were 34? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What if one of them supernatural boys decided that he was going to go mono e masco with Jason Voorhees? Yeah. It's fascinating how during this wave of, hey, let's remake everything, there were so many movies that just came out with a fart. And the Friday the 13th remake was probably one of the biggest farts of them all. So come back and see us in two weeks' time, and we will be discussing the fart that is the Friday the 13th remake from the early 2000s as we continue this Halloween fantastic horror movie spooktacular though any final thoughts that you have on the amityville horror remake from the early aughts i know you're all wondering when we can get more of these ryan reynolds impressions but don't worry green lantern is out there season sucks <laughs> we'll see you in two weeks time everybody